there is this place that God is taking us. I'm very excited about this turn that we're making. Hopefully you're making this turn with us. We're giving you some tools and some teachings. And matter of fact, how many of you, you don't have to be weird about this if you didn't, but how many of you text and kind of downloaded this week the fasting of your negative thoughts? How many of you did that? Would you raise your hand if you, if you participated in that? Quite a number of us. And you, you can still do that by texting 33777, and it'll just come onto your phone every day. And man, it's a powerful things that you're reading and you're going forward in what we're doing, and that's a part of it, is taking some things away. So we're, we're going to go there a little bit today, because as we've been talking about spiritual disciplines, and I want to encourage you to take the back of your program, turn it over, take a pen. If you need one, our ushers can give you a pen. If you'll raise your hand, they'll come and give you one. But take some notes. Whatever you hear today that might be pertinent to what you, where you're going, where you are, throw some things down. Take some notes, okay? And I guarantee you in the midst of this today, you're going to hear something through through me or the Holy Spirit to just actually go forward. So if you need a pen, raise your hand. Our ushers are helping you do that now. And just remember that we've covered some, we're halfway through this spiritual discipline. We're exactly halfway through. We've, we've covered six already. Today is seven. We've covered celebration. We've covered guidance. We've covered worship. All these are spiritual disciplines within themselves. Confession, prayer. Last week, we talked about fasting. Some of you actually emailed me, and you're, you were fasting some real physical things, and I was praying for you, so thanks for communicating that back to me. And a lot of you took place in the fasting of your negative thoughts and how to replace those things. And so we're going to move forward today with this discipline that's somewhat hard as we just experience. It's the discipline of meditation. Meditation. Because meditation in the Christian world has kind of been hijacked. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments where the Bible tells us, you know, nearly a hundred times throughout the scriptures to meditate and meditate and meditate. But how do you do that? Because see, we live in a very strange and weird world. Agree? We live in a weird place. And if you're over 40 like I am, and I'm about at that 60 decade here, you, you know we live in a real strange world. We live in a world that, like I didn't think we would ever get to this place where we are. And I'm not just talking about politically or I'm talking about every which way that you can think. We live in a weird world. For example, I, I saw this and wrote this into my notes and didn't want to skip this because I would have never thought this because me growing up as a kid, a video game, maybe you can relate to this, a video game was a like a a, a white bar here and a white bar here. Are you, go, you know where I'm going? And there was like a white dot that came on the screen and it would just, you take the bar with something, you know, and you ping and the bar and the little dot would go about that fast. And remember those? That's, was that Atari? Was that what that was? And so that's, we've evolved pretty heavy in this weird world that we live in because back in July, Anyone ever heard of the, uh, uh, the game Fortnite? If you have, raise your hand. If you've heard of Fortnite, raise your hand, okay? If you've never heard the, the word or the game Fortnite, raise your hand if you've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Wow, we live in a weird world. There's more people that have never heard of it in here than have heard of it. And this is where we are. This is the strangest because back in July of this year, a 16-year-old, get that to your, a 16-year-old won $3 million for being the champion of Fortnite. $3 million. That's more. Now, look, I'm a big golfer. Anybody golf? That's more than anybody has ever won at a single golf. Even the Masters only pays out $2 million. Now it's $2.1 million. So here we got a 16-year-old making more money playing a video game. And I may be just giving people permission. Thank God the middle schoolers are out of here. Giving them permission to just play more video games when the parents are going, why are you saying this? Because we live in a weird world. And some of us are still asking again, what is Fortnite again that you can win $3 million? What is that? This game didn't even come on the scene until two, two, 2017. 2017, and it's taken over the universe. Why am I saying that in the middle of this? Because studies now tell us that as a result of our, come on, pull them out, of our technology addiction. How many of you have your, you're, you're scared to do this because you don't know what I'm going to do. How many of you have your phones with you right now? Raise your hands. Come on. 
everybody. How many of you, when you left this morning, does this happen to anybody? When you left this morning, you forgot your phone, turned around and went and got it. Anybody? Yeah, there you go. It happens all the time. But if you leave your kid, oh, well, they'll just have to be on their own. (laughs) I can't live without my phone, but anybody else, anything else, they can just hang back there. As a result of our technology addiction, believe it or not, you know this, we're just not willing to do anything about it. Relational skills are dwindling. We're not, we're not learning how to interact with people anymore. And it's really starting to affect. It's affecting families because families are, are breaking apart at rapid paces as a result of technology. It's amazing that when my wife and I go on a date, we'll look over and we'll see families sitting at a table, all of them on a screen, not communicating with them. Maybe they are communicating with one another, but it's on the screen. I don't know. This generation is turning more and more and more to a screen for fulfillment. And we're part of that. Anxiety now, as a result of it, has a seat at every family table. Anxiety. Because we're not sure what to do with it. We're not sure how to control it. We're not sure how to bring squares or boundaries around this thing that's an addiction in all of our lives. And it's younger and younger and younger that it's happening to. Kids are living as a result of it in a fishbowl of comparison of comparison. And as a result of that, bullying has now just become an epidemic in elementary schools, living life at a faster pace than ever before. And now officially, this generation that we're in has been labeled scientifically, officially the loneliest generation ever. And I thought all this stuff was supposed to get us together. (laughs) Maybe that was the big deception, the loneliest generation ever. Maybe it's time for us to learn what meditation really is. Maybe it's time for us to learn how to, here's a big word, write it down, detach. I want you to write it down, but there's some more coming. We need to learn how to detach because that's at the heart of the discipline of meditation, to detach. So what happens in this discipline of meditation? We actually have to create an emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to construct an inner sanctuary of our heart. We have to create this. Look, that's why it's a discipline. You have to create it. And the more we're going deeper into controls of electronics and screens and pace of hurry, the more we're going there, the harder that is to create this emotional space. No one likes a lack of noise anymore. We go to sleep with fans on and white noise, and we don't like it when there's no noise. We don't like it to create these spaces. But please listen to me. Listen to me. As I had you write down the word detach, I need you to know that detachment is not enough. That's the trick of Eastern religion when it comes to meditation. All they want you to do is detach and empty yourself. That's the trick. We have to move on to attachment. So if you wrote down detach, you have to write down, please, I have to move toward attachment. The detachment from noise and the detachment from confusion all around us has to lead us somewhere. It can't just lead us to emptiness. The detachment from noise and the detachment from confusion, the detachment from addiction has to lead us to God. Christian biblical meditation from the word of God as it speaks to us to meditate is not just about emptying yourself. I, you need to hear that this morning. It's not just about emptying yourself. It's about filling your heart with truth. It's about filling your mind with truth. It's about filling your soul with truth in God's word, which is why God spoke to us. Jesus spoke to us and said, hey, here's the greatest command. Love me. How? With all of your heart, soul soul, mind, strength, everything. Don't empty your mind and just love me with your heart. You got to love me with all of it. Fill it with all of it. 
It's about your heart. It's about your mind. It's about your strength. It's about your soul. Richard Foster, who wrote a book entitled Celebration of Discipline, which is all about the spiritual disciplines, and most of this series is coming out of this book from us. I'm writing small group discussions. If you're not in a small group, you don't know this, but if you are, you've seen some of these discussions that are coming strictly out of the book by Richard Foster, and he wrote this on the screen. Look, Christian meditation very simply is the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. It's that simple. He goes on to say, we, we want it to be more complex. We want it to be more difficult, but it's just that simple. To hear God's voice, you have to create a space for it to hear God's voice and then do what the voice is telling you to do. It's just that simple. So let's get some scripture in here today. I want you to turn with me. I'm going to put it on the screen. But if you have a device, an iPad, uh, an iPhone, whatever, and you have scripture on there, I want you to actually get there, maybe highlight some things on your device. If you actually brought a paper Bible with you, you can use your eyeballs and turn it over there and then maybe underline a few things. Because I'm going to read, which is very uncommon for us, but I'm going to read quite a number, quite a bit of scripture right off the bat here. So hang with me. Stay awake. Don't, if someone next to is nodding elbow him. You got permission, okay? If elbow and don't work, hit him upside the head. Whatever it takes for them to stay awake for the scripture. But we're going to go all the way back. We have to go all the way back to the creation of man to see where we are today. Isn't that kind of unique? So Genesis chapter 2 is where we're going, and we're going to move right into chapter 3. We're going to read the last verse of chapter 2. We're the ones who put chapters and verses on these things. When they were written, there was no chapters. There were no verses. So we're just going to kind of continue it on in, all right? But in Genesis 2.25, it says this. So let's read quite a bit. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Listen, guys, the enemy will always tell you the opposite of what God says. And the way he does that is he's trying to tell you that God just wants to rip you off. God just wants to minimize life for you. God just wants you to have the least of the least. When in fact, the Bible says that Jesus came in John 10, 10, remember, that you would have life and life to the fullest, or in the old version, it says more abundantly than you've ever had it. Let's keep reading verse five. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, she ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened. They knew they were naked. Remember how this started? They were naked and not ashamed. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. We've been doing it ever since among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was, a na I was naked, I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman. <laughs> Some things never change, do they? The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. You know, the origin of the blame and victim culture didn't start with Twitter and hashtag. The origin of the blame culture started right there. It's not my fault. It's your fault, God. 
you gave me this woman. It's not my fault. And then the woman looks over and says, not my fault. It's his fault. He deceived me. And the man looks up and he's supposed to be the one in charge. It's not my fault. It's her fault. Everybody's pointing fingers because everybody is not guilty. Nothing is my fault anymore. I'm a victim. I'm a victim of my circumstances. I'm a victim of my background. I'm a victim of my upbringing. I'm a victim of the world which is around me. And the enemy loves this because as long as we continue to abdicate personal responsibility, we will feel no need for transformation. Can I say that again? As long as we keep abdicating personal responsibility, we will feel no need for transformation. And I'm telling you that most of us today, not just in this room, but in the church at large, in the world at large, Christianity at large, I just read a Pew Research study this week that said now church attendance is going down even more and the average Christian, Christ follower, the average person who's experienced Christ is going to church 1.3 times a month. Because we feel no need for transformation. Everything else is happening, and we're like, this isn't adding value to my life. Everything else is adding value to my life, and I'm a victim of it anyway. And so we just stay victims, and we stay addicts, and we stay addicted to all this stuff. And that becomes the lot in our life if we're not careful. So therefore, many of us walk around never experiencing freedom. Freedom that is yours in Christ Jesus. We started this text. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were naked and not ashamed. Naked and not ashamed. Not just physically, emotionally, you name it. And so I just want to kind of balance what I'm saying before we get too deep into this today, that there are people in this room, when I look at a crowd like this, there are people sitting in this room, listening online, listening in the family viewing room. You've never had a day in your life where you did not feel shame because of something that took place in your life. Some of you are right here, right now, trying to become free from shame. You've never experienced a day without it. You just haven't been able to detach yourself from shame. And then there's something that comes along with shame, kind of the big brother of shame, if you will, and it's called condemnation. And it covers you. And then you look at the world and life through this grid of shame. And you can't see anything clearly because it's a shame grid that you're looking through. And nothing seems to be in order. Everything's distorted. And that's the darkness that most people today live in. And so we hide from God. And we hide from reality. And we addict ourselves to technology and various other types of things. And and this is the darkness that so many people live in, that darkness of shame, that darkness of condemnation, always hearing this voice in your mind that you are a mistake, that you will never be good enough. And that voice came from somewhere, someone that loved you, someone that was in command or authority over you, someone that loved you deeply, that you respected, at some point could have said something like that, something in that neighborhood. You'll never amount to anything. There's something wrong with you. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're not athletic enough. You're not worth anything. And some of those voices are still rolling through our heads in some fashion. And sometimes that doesn't go away with age like everything else does. Sometimes it gets worse. Some of us in this room, you were adopted and you're still living with the shame of abandonment because you still don't know why your biological parents didn't want you. 
Some of us, it's as simple as being cut from a sports team because you were told, red line, you weren't good enough to make the team. And so it just screams inside of you, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. I don't have what it takes. And you take that into everything. And you're not even engaged in the body of Christ in any form of leadership when someone's even asked you because that happened so long ago and you're still saying, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. You were let go from a job, and you're still hearing, you're not enough. You're not enough. And you're still trying to get people to like you and to perform in such a way that affirmation will come your way from people because you keep hearing, you're not enough. Our society today, are you with me, church? Our society today screams at us in every which way, you are not enough. We just become infatuated as a result of that screaming in our ears. And we become infatuated with being thinner. We become infatuated with being fitter. We become infatuated with being richer, smarter. We spend most of our life trying to be in the land of Ur. And then when we finally get to Ur, we realize that we are not the thinest. We are not the fitest. We are not the richest. We are not the smartest. And so we're either erring or esting, but we're never being who God have called you and created you and breathed in you to be. And that's where we are today. You are created in the image of God. You know that here, but it's never dropped down into here for some reason because you've never meditated on it long enough to be truth in your life. You are filled with God-given destiny. You are. And some of you need to have some self-talk and say, I have been given God-given destiny. I have been given God-given potential. I have been given a breath from the Holy Spirit and the power of the Almighty God who with one word created everything. You need to say that. You need to believe that. But every voice in our world tells you somehow you're not good enough. Every voice in the world as I approach the age that I'm approaching tells me, oh, you're just too old now. There's a shelf life here. There's, you're never going to be who you were. You're never going to be this anymore. You're never going to do that. Or there's some of us, you're just too young. You're just too young. You're just too young. You're not a good enough father. You're not a good enough mother. Can't you see that? You're not a good enough wife. You're not a good enough husband. And folks, that's a dark place to live, but many people are living there. In the church, we're living there. Just try to live in the shoes of me telling you once to get somebody to engage into the church life, engage into leadership, and listen to everything that comes out that says, no, I can't do that. No, I'm not meant to do that. No, I can't. I'm not enough. No, you don't want me. No, I'm not good enough. No, 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 no. And it's the message that screams louder than the truth. And it's a dark place for us to live. But unfortunately, too many of us are living there. I need to really quickly give you, very quickly give you three things that darkness does to you. And we're living in this darkness of condemnation. We're living in this darkness that these voices are rolling through our heads and it's not truth. So write them down. They're on the screen. Three things. Number one, darkness. And just pretend that we're in a dark room. We tried to do that today, but those windows up there wouldn't let us do it. But then you couldn't write notes. <laughs> Darkness conceals your identity. It's what it does. You don't even know who you are because you can't see yourself. And then when you're living there, you don't even believe. I could be screaming at the top of my lungs, which some of you say, you are. Stop. Don't scream anymore. And you still wouldn't believe me. That you are God. Breathed. Darkness confuses your surroundings. You can't see where you're going. You have no hope. 
You're not even sure that you are going. Here's what most of us are doing. We're just putting one foot in front of another, trying to make a living to get enough money, to buy enough bread, to eat and get the energy so we can go back to work, to get the energy, to get the money. And it's just a circle of darkness that we live in. And then we consume ourselves with stuff. And the more stuff we have, the more fulfilled we are, then we realize, no, that's not truth. And now we don't know what to do because we're back into the cycle again. Darkness confines you number three to having to rely on what you feel totally dependent on having to feel your way ever been in a dark room last night with my grandson we're playing hide and seek in the dark house all the lights have to be off nothing has to be on except for his flashlight <laughs> and i stumped my toe about five different times because you have to feel your way through. And what that does is it slows you down and you're not sure that you can go forward anymore. And that's why we are living our life. The enemy wants you to feel like you are never enough in this place of darkness. And the enemy, what he's done and what he will continue to do is to make sure that you and I live our life so busy, so maxed out, that the only voice you hear is the voice of shame in this darkness because you don't know how to get out of the darkness. And that's where we are living in this busyness, living in this this turmoil of going and the cycle, just not knowing when it's going to stop. And the only thing that can happen, hey, our worship team is awesome. And Stuart, where are you? I don't even know if you're here. So there you are over there. It's good to see you back in the drum cage. Because he had to get out of San Jose. (laughs) And he lives in Austin, Texas. And we're trying to convince him to move back. But you know what? Everything here says it's just too busy here. It's too crazy here. The commute. How many of you experienced that living right here? And that's just what the enemy wants us to always feel and always experience like the only way I can get through this is to go somewhere else and Stuart that wasn't meant as a dig the shame says this shame says I didn't make a mistake shame says I am a mistake and you live there And some of you, I just sense this moment right there that some of you, that's exactly what you're feeling right now. And you're not. Because see, that's a lie of the darkness. But that voice is very real. Fact is, I did make a mistake. I have made many of them. That's fact. Fact is, I personally have heard people tell me that I'm not good enough. In many different places, in many different venues of life. Fact is, I've heard someone that I love tell me that there was no use in keep going where I was going. Fact is, I've heard my own mom tell me at one point when I left one place to go to another place that I shouldn't have done it because I wasn't close to her. And that sends a mixed message like, do I follow mom or do I follow God? What does she say? What does God say? And we live in this just craziness of who do I follow? Where do I go? See, fact is, you may have a birth certificate that doesn't have your biological parent's name on there and that you were abandoned. And you're you're going, okay, Cal, what do I do with that fact? And all those facts, and I could just keep going on and on and on and on with the fact, and that's where you have to make a choice. Do you meditate or medicate? And some of us have made the choice to just medicate. And we've medicated on all sorts of things. And I could, again, make a list as long as the screen on the medications. And some of the medications aren't really bad. At one point in my life, my medication to run from this stuff was to just get more fit and to run more triathlons and to train more and to train more. And two or three times a day, I was either in the pool, on a bike, on the run, and I was just training until one day my wife looked at me and said, you know, I love you and I love the fact that you feel like you have a purpose outside of ministry, but I feel like a single mom. Is you're never here. I was medicating in fitness. So what do you do with meditation? 
Meditation will give you a higher voice to listen to. It's the voice of spiritual truth. Listen, that will overshadow, if you allow it, overshadow fact. It's the truth of the word of God. Fact may be that someone loved you and said they would love you till death left you. That's fact. But Hebrews 13, truth says, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Are you with me? Fact. Someone who loved you said, I don't want to be with you anymore. Proverbs 18, truth says that he will stick closer to you than a brother. That's truth. Fact. Your biological parents didn't want you. Isaiah 49 says, truth, God knew you before you even entered your mother's womb. Truth. Ephesians 2, truth says, I am your masterpiece, your creator, and I've already prepared for you before you were even born good works for you to walk in. That's truth. What am I saying here? I'm saying that in meditation, you learn to build your life on godly truth, not fact. That's the beauty of meditation. That's the depth of meditation. Build your life on the truth of God's word, not the facts. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said to those who believed. This morning, Pastor Archie said, for those of you who believe, let's take communion because here's what communion means. Here's what communion represents. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, to those of you who believe, if you abide in my word, not fact, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth, help me, will set you free. And some of you are like, that's what I desire. I just want to be free from these voices. I just want to be free from this mindset. I want to be free from this darkness. And that's the beauty of meditation. That's why we actually even started last week with fasting negative thoughts to replace them with godly truth. Wasn't just something we think of, oh, that's a cool thing. No, it builds upon, builds upon, builds upon where we're going so that you can operate and walk in your spiritual gifting because you were created, breathed in the image of God to do good works even before the earth was formed. That's fact. And that truth will set you free. But we have an enemy. We have an enemy trying to get you to question truth. That's the nature of our whole culture today. Did God really say? Is it really godly? Did the Bible, the Bible's archaic. I mean, should I really not do this now? Should I really not have sex before? See, the enemy will get you to question everything, God says, because he's going to tell you just like he did Adam and Eve, that God's trying to rip you off. God's trying to keep you from something. God's trying to limit your life. God's trying to put you in a box when actually God's trying to set you free. God's trying to protect you. God's trying to be with you and walk with you and show you that there's life and life more abundantly. In the Old Testament, God told Joshua, if you're familiar with this story, I'm not going to go there deep, but in the Old Testament, God said to Joshua, who took over from Moses, I want you to meditate on this word day and night. What was this word? This word was be strong and courageous. He said that to Joshua three different occasions, be strong, be courageous. Friends, Joshua was the mightiest warrior that the Old Testament of Israel ever had seen. That guy was unbelievable when it came to warfare. And yet God said, I want you to be strong. I need you to be courageous and meditate on this word day and night. Meditate on this word day and night. Why? Because the fact was that he had seen the enemy and the enemy was so big and made him look like grasshoppers. And his friends had even said that. Fact is he'd seen Jericho and it was fortified like any other city he'd ever seen. Those were facts. But the truth is God said, I've already given you that land. It's yours. Go get it. That's truth. New Testament, Jesus was on his way to heal a little girl from a a man named Jairus. Remember that? He was interrupted with a woman who touched the hem of his garment. Fact was, the people came and said to Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your little girl's dead. Jesus overheard what they were saying and said to Jairus, don't listen to them. 
That's not fact. The truth is I am able to do more than you can imagine. I can do the impossible because with man, it's too difficult and impossible. But with God, listen, nothing is. And you have a choice today. You have a choice to walk from this room, to sit in this room, to to, to sing the last song with either fact, which is fact, or truth, which overcomes that. This is why meditation is so vital. Remember what it said, Richard Foster, simply to hear the word of God. It's not complex. And to walk in the word of God. Not just hear it, but to obey it, to walk in it. See, the enemy is after your purpose. He will question truth to steal your purpose. Our purpose is not just to be on earth, as I've already stated, for you just to make a living. You have a greater purpose. And the enemy is stealing the purpose of God's kids. Back to Genesis 3.1, the first question that was ever asked, did God really say? Did God really say? Very relevant today, isn't it? Did God really say that marriage has to look like this? Did God really say that you can't go? Did God really say that? Did God say you need to know what God has said? It's truth. And meditation and the discipline of it does that. It gives you truth. It allows you to walk in truth, not doubt and not darkness. But truth, but you have to meditate and meditate and meditate. As the word says, don't let this depart from you. Don't let it get away from you. That's the importance of community and small groups, sticking together, speaking truth. Even when fact comes in and somebody walks in with a bad week, fact is, man, my job is horrible. Truth is, you're an overcomer. And the truth can overshadow the fact when it's spoken to you and in you. So how do we get this? So let's close it up. Let's wrap it up and tie it with a bow. Are you with me? You there? Respond. You there? (laughs) Adam and Eve ate the fruit, right? Shame entered the world. They hid in fear. Second question asked in the Bible by God, not the enemy. Question was, where are you? Now, let me ask you this simple question on top of this question that's practical. Do you not think that God didn't know where they were hiding in the bushes? He didn't ask them to find out where they were physically. He says this question with a, where are you? Because you used to come running to me when you heard me. Where are you? Because you couldn't wait to get to me when you heard my footsteps walking in the garden. And some of us, he's saying that today. Where are you? Because when you come into this place, into this gathering, you couldn't wait to get here. Now you show up and it's okay. It's drum. It's a little bit this. Oh, I hope they do this. Where are you? I'm not even sure that you're coming here to meet God. You might be just coming here to worship the worship. God's asking those questions today to you and I. Where are you? What's occupying most of your time besides me? Why are you staying away from me? Why are you hiding? Why are you running when I'm walking towards you? Why is this going on? God's asking that question. Where are you? So here's the question that I want to actually close with. It's the third question in the Bible. In verse 11, Genesis 3, God says, who told you that you were naked? Who told you this? Who told you the lie that paralyzed you from your purpose? And now all you're doing is making a living. Who told you that lie? Here it is. Are you ready? Last question of the day to overshadow those questions to bring it practical. And you need to kind of answer this this week in the moment of meditation. Whose voice have you elevated? above the voice of God? Is it the voice of Facebook? Is it the voice of your career? Is it the voice of somebody that 
said something years and years ago that's still rolling through your brain because it's darkness? Whose voice have you allowed to be elevated above the voice of your creator? That's what I want you to meditate on this week. That's what I want you to just think about, and roll around inside of your soul. Whose voice have you elevated above the voice of God? Would you close your eyes with me all across this place? Remember what meditation is, friends. It's the ability to hear God's voice and simply obey his truth. A few months ago in our house, we have a pool outside of our backyard. My little grandson, who was six, was out, and my wife had some of her team. She, Tina and my wife, oversees one of the welcome teams here at Point. Some of her high school friends were coming over, and they were hanging out at the pool. And Luke, six-year-old who's an only son he's just out there loving every bit of it these teenage girls man they're just loving every bit of it but finally one of them said you can't do that and Luke just the six-year-old son just kind of propped his shoulders back stuck his chest out and I'm over there listening and I'm listening to what's going on and he says yes I can no you can't do that yes I can Who told you you could do that? My daddy said I could do it. And I thought about that as I studied this, just swimming across the pool by yourself because your daddy said you could do it. Your daddy said you you were good enough. I thought about when the enemy's voice comes to you. He says, who told you you could do that? You can't do that. You can't walk in that kind of victory. You can't get that. You can't go there. You can't change. You'll never change. Our our reaction needs to be, yes, I can. And when they say, who told you that? My daddy, my father, God. And that's the relationship that comes with intimacy, friends, through meditation. He doesn't become your cosmic father limiting you. He becomes your heavenly dad. that one scripture that we use so often, Jeremiah 29 11, really come to life. I've not come to harm you. I've come to give you future. <laughs> future. I'm your dad. I love you. And if nothing else today, as you sit here in this moment, I need you to hear in your spirit, God say, I'm with you. I love you. There's no one like you. I created you with you in mind. I had good works planned out for your workmanship and you were crafted in such a way that no one else is crafted. It's you. And I'm challenging you now as we go into this next song to start now meditating meditating, listening to the voice of God. Don't sing the song because it's a song. Listen to the lyrics to it. Hear what it's saying to you. Hear what God is saying to you today. As we close, eyes closed, heads bowed all across this place. We quoted the scripture of John 8 earlier and said, truth will set you free. Jesus said a little bit earlier, he said, I am the truth and the life. That's Jesus. So maybe today you're in this room and you've never asked truth to live inside of you. Jesus. You know he's here. You know he's out there. You hear about him, but you've never asked him to live in you, to guide you as truth. I'm going to give you that opportunity to accept Jesus 
is the Lord and truth, Savior of your life. It's a simple prayer. It starts with Jesus, I give you my life. If you need to accept Jesus today as your Savior, because you never have asked him to come inside of you, would you just do that right now and just can I pray with you as well just be bold enough with all eyes closed just raise your hand and say Cal that's me I'm praying that prayer right now Jesus I give you my life thank you ma'am thank you Jesus thank you sir I give you my life thank you I give you my life that's just the start of the journey you gotta get community so that somebody can help you continue to meditate on truth. We'll be glad to set you up to do that today if you stop and speak to us. Jesus.